Massive thank you as always to our top tier patrons, Sarah Turner and Alexander Lashley. For as little as $3, you can gain access to patron-only episodes, as well as access to our Discord server, where we host weekly live discussions with host Ekoi Hero and myself. So if you like what you hear, come join us at patreon.com forward slash it's not just in your head. Please do rate us on Apple Podcasts and follow us on social media. We're on Reddit, TikTok, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you have any questions or comments about this episode or the podcast in general, then email it's not just in your head at gmail.com. Today, psychotherapist Harriet Fraud and substance abuse counselor Ikoi Hiro are joined by Alisa Marjub, who was born into a cult, specifically the Unification Church, aka the Moonies. In the mental health field, too often, we've made it seem as if it's just in your head. Just in your head. Like the landlord can hijack the rent by 20%. That impacts people's mental health. We can't have a profit-driven mental health care system if we want our people to be connected and healthy. Um, yeah, it was pretty interesting. Uh, so I put a thing out on the Patreon just saying uh, what the subject was going to be. And uh, quite a few people left a lot of questions. Um, oh, and okay. some people... Uh, also uh, either had experiences with uh, a cult, as it were. I think one person was uh, also born into a cult and um, mm-hmm. got out. So, yeah, there's a whole bunch of questions. I don't know, Ekoi or Harriet, if you had anything to kick off, but I definitely obviously have this sort of list of things in front of me. Why in this society at this time would people want to join a cult? What does a cult offer people that something so destructive could be compelling? Uh, In my experience, a lot of it is that it offers community. Um, It offers a sense of belonging, a purpose, uh, you know, like sort of a reason to exist for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's something, you know, that's hard to find in today's society under capitalism, honestly, because, I mean, everything Mm -hmm. is basically built for us to not have that and to sort of uh, like prevent us from gaining that. And so cults and like extreme, or like I would say like, yeah, some of more extremist and fundamentalist religious communities offer that because they have, they have those like, like it's not healthy connection. It's, you know, trauma based, but they have ways to, you know, it's very much, you know, a community. Yeah. That's important. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Powerful. Right. Is there any sort of meaningful difference um, maybe this is all just sort of a language game, but is there any sort of meaningful difference between a cult or a religion? Is a religion just an old cult? You know, is <laughs> is is capitalism yeah. a cult? You would, you know, it's like how do you define this sort of stuff um, on a personal level? I mean, have, do you have you thought about that, or is it just sort of the least important thing <laughs> to think yeah, about? Yeah, well, I've thought about it a lot actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, on a personal level, I would say that a cult uh, is some sort of like very hierarchical system that uh, uses a lot of manipulat- manipulative and coercive as well as abusive tactics to keep people in line with whatever its you know goals or ideology is. Um, it yeah, it doesn't. It comes from a place of control. It comes from a place of conformity and assimilation. Uh, instead of a place of diversity and, you know, respect for others and their beliefs and who they may be. Yeah, that's a so, great yeah, I think, answer. Yeah. thank you. I, I, so I think, yeah, cult can be pretty broadly defined in that way. In my opinion, like I would call America a cult. I would call, uh, you know, soul cycle a cult, you know, like there are different things that could be a cult that maybe are not like a religious cult, like specifically on the books. Can, can but, I ask what soul cycle is? Cause that's something one of the patrons mentioned as well. Um, so I guess it's this like a uh, cycling class uh, that has like different, you know, like uh, like cycling centers you can go to. And they're very uh, <laughs> they're very intense, I guess, and uh, sort of like, you know, insular and have their own sort of like, I guess, you know, way of seeing the world or you know interacting at least like very specifically with cycling. It's a it's a weird thing to look into if if you ever want to take that little route on the internet. Yeah, salvation in soul cycle has a lot to do with the frenetic exercise diet regimes of soul cycle, which also costs money. Mm, right, there's like a multi-level marketing uh, as well as like a new age aspect to it. Mm-hmm. But I've never been religious, but I've had a lot of clients 
you know, family of friends, um, friends that have, you know, spent short time in cult. And, and one thing that I think is, is also part of like the seeking community thing is that, you know, we as a society have very little ways of dealing with conflict mm-hmm. very well. You know, and so like I remember one of my coworkers, um, yeah, she she joined the left before I met her, but you know, she was going through a phase where she had a fallout with her best friend. Um, and she also got into uh, a divorce that she wasn't, you know, blindsided by a divorce that she wasn't expecting. And so for her, a lot of, you know, she's also had um, kind of chaotic, dysfunctional family relationships. And one of the reasons that, like, you know, a cult appealed to her during that period of vulnerability was just like, she was like, I just wanted to be where everyone was on the same page because Mm -hmm. I felt like that would reduce conflict in my life. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a big thing. I mean, like that sort of conformity thing. It's uh, also sort of goes into another reason people join cults is because there are so many decisions to make in life that it can be overwhelming at times. And just having that dictated to you is sometimes easier for people um, because then they don't have. I mean, that autonomy is taken away, but at the same time, they already have. Like, there's a there's a answer to everything basically already. They can just go by whatever the leaders say. Right. You don't you don't have to make choices anymore. Right. And and for um, a lot of times, yeah, it seems everyone that I've talked to that has been, you know, that that aren't necessarily second generation, but, you know, that joined willingly, mm-hmm. um, you know, often did during like a vulnerable time. Right. You know, your yeah. your career is, you know, is is really shaky and, you know, you're losing confidence in your ability to like survive and make a living you know, in this world is also like a another big thing because a lot of you know some of the more extreme cults do offer like do provide housing and whatnot as part of like you know you join us at our compound right yeah (laughs) yeah and so oh yeah like oh i don't have to worry about rent or bills anymore i don't have to worry about like my basic survival right Yeah. yeah people find that freeing in a way even though it's basically like another form of prison you know but uh there's so many decisions to be made and like so many complications to those, especially living under capitalism. Everything is uh, for the vast majority of people, like a lot of resources are completely out of reach and a cult community can sort of be a way to get people to maybe not particularly good resources, but more than none, maybe. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. But I wonder is, you know, the United States is of the Western supposed democracies the most capitalist, the least mitigated by powerful socialist communist movements. Do we have in the United States more cult activities than they have elsewhere? Because if loneliness is a huge driver, we are, I think, the loneliest people, as well Mm. as getting the prize in most mass murders and so on. I wonder if our cult activity is greater. Is it? I don't, I don't know. Like Japan is has the yeah, part of the kickoff to this was um, at least the interest, kind of renewed interest in the topic was the assassination of Shinzo Abe mm-hmm. in Japan, and that being connected to the um, the Moonies, right? Which is what's the formal name again? It, uh, the it Unification changed. Church. Yes, you, is that the formal name, or is it? Uh, didn't they change? So that, they've had yeah. several over time. Uh, over it, they've had yeah. also a uh, Holy Spirit Association for World Peace and Unification, and then they're about like a million different front group front groups, and now they're also several sects. So there are a lot of different names flying around that are basically uh, synonymous, more or less, for, uh, with the same movement. Right, right, and yeah, uh, and they have. I mean, a, a lot of Japanese politics have very strong cult ties yeah komeito is soka gakai which is considered like a buddhist cult right the liberal Mm -hmm. democratic party which was shinzo abe's party has very strong ties to the unification church and and yeah uh, the the sarin gas tokyo attack was om shinrikyo and that was also so like yeah. the New Age Buddhist cult. And that had, you know, that also had very strong ties to several politicians as well. Mm-hmm. 
Well, one of the factors that I've noticed in U.S. cults is that they're not allowed to get involved politically because they don't want any distraction from the cult. You know, so then in the Seventh Day Adventists or the um, what do they call those Jehovah's Witnesses? They are not allowed to participate politically. Hmm. I don't. See, that's you really know. interesting because, like, coming from the Moody standpoint, everything is intensely political from like day one, basically. Um, and the things that I've learned along my research, looking into sort of the history of the Moonies, is that uh, the Moonies, but as well as many other cults, have been uh, historically used as a tool and tactic of uh, imperialism and fascism uh, to sort of, you know, get pe people on the same page, uh, as well as like you know, for sort of like psychological warfare reasons, as well as to um, traffic and, uh, you know, smuggle various things and people, money, drugs, uh, probably jewels, you know, you name it, basically. Uh, which Could uh, you explain movie. that more? <laughs> yeah, Can so um, there are, okay, gosh, how, how do I even begin this subject. So um, I guess you could say that there is a precedent for uh, specifically even like United States uh, intelligence agencies uh, being involved with cults. Um, it goes back to at least uh, the 30s and 40s, uh, back with groups like Moral Rearmament, which I which has like a lot of, I feel like uh, very similar themes to the Moonies. Uh, that was part of mm -hmm. the Oxford group movement started by what, Frank Buckman, I believe, uh, the, right. also the AA guy. Yes, um, yes, yes, I was just yeah. about to say. Yeah, because yeah. AA is also another like, you know, secular cult, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it, it sort of like goes back from that time period of uh, cults like that. Uh, uh, Scientology later on, obviously the Moonies, uh, like, uh, you know, uh, oh gosh, what is it? A tem uh, Temple of God. What is that? Uh, the Jonestown. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. People's Temple, that's it. Yeah. Um, uh, just like a lot of these different cults have like different connections to various facets within the intelligence apparatus here in the United States, but also abroad, um, which is also where the Moonies sort of come in because they were started as basically a byproduct of the Korean War and the Cold War atmosphere. Um, and very reverent uh, moon, know, yeah, yeah, because um, like I mean, from the outset, it was very much like anti-communist uh, against sort of like an operation uh, to gather people and support against the North and stuff. And over the past, the Moonies at least have been um, involved very much in like the world political scene through things like the World Anti-Communist League uh, and other other various organizations of them. Uh, there's uh, in such scandals as a uh, korea gate when uh the kcia who has direct links to the moonies uh there was a, a scandal where there was some supposed influence peddling in washington um however i don't see that the cia didn't know about this given the relationship between the kcia and the cia and how the cia also uh continued to ha benefit from relationships with the moonies and things like iran contra um and uh, like, for instance, I know the Moonies gave a lot of like material support and aid as well as did a lot of propaganda uh, for in support of the Contras. Uh, there's also reason to believe that they may have been directly involved with like drug smuggling there uh, and money smuggling, as well as um, like uh, potentially like training people to fight with them. Uh, that Those details are going to be like a little harder to prove, per se, but there is like long since like the time that was happening been speculation around that. Um, for more information on that, I would look into uh, any articles uh, by Robert Parry in the Consortium News, uh, as well as uh, it's in some places mentioned by Gary Webb in some of his writings. They uh, posted a lot of expose around Iran Contra and stuff. Uh, a lot of great work those guys Rest did. in peace, Gary. <laughs> right. Oh, gosh. And Robert. I think Robert has passed as well. Um, oh, no. Yeah. Uh, but... So also, uh, I mean, and going in that line, uh, the Moonies were also directly involved in helping overthrow the Bolivian government during the cocaine coup. Uh, they worked directly with uh, the Nazi, ex-Nazi, quote unquote, because nobody really stops being a Nazi, um, Klaus Barbie, to overthrow the government there. Uh, so it that's, I mean, just like a, a small slice of what they have done on the global scale. And uh, it all just sort of relates back into supporting U.S. capital. Yeah, from the from the brief reading I did about um, the Moonies, I I could understand why the founder was anti-communist because he was in a work camp for like nearly a decade mm -hmm. or something. So you can understand sort of from personal experience feeling a bit pissed 
<laughs> and being like, right, right yeah, well, yeah. I'm going to, you know, they're my enemy number one. Get them back. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the South Korean CIA link was fascinating because it is referenced to, I think it's on the Wikipedia page and it's referenced to a New York Times investigation mm -hmm. piece back in the 70s, maybe, something like that. And yeah, um, yeah it's pretty uh, blatant that, that there is a connection. And like you say, it sort of politically is a useful uh, the group was useful uh, for the CIA to... Yes, extremely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and it's fascinating. On many levels. Right. It is well, fascinating. Good. It's horrifying, but fascinating. Also, side note, if if anybody wants to know more about the Tongsun Park scandal and Koreagate, um, the influence peddling uh, uh, thing, there's a great book called Gifts of Deceit. Um, check that out. Yeah, it's interesting you were mentioning that you sort of become uh, politically switched on inside the moonies yeah right um yeah and one of the questions from l was uh the assassination of the former japanese prime minister was because you know this guy's mum had lost everything to the church and he said mm -hmm. did you hear about situations like this often or were you or other members sheltered from news about any negative impacts because i imagine if you're told to be you know politically aware in some fashion yeah that must be difficult information to digest. Yeah. So I would say growing up while I was in the movement, I didn't hear about as many incidents like that. But now that I'm out, I've heard about a lot of different incidents that were, um, you know, violent and uh, tragic uh, and, you know, horrible that uh, other, you know, second generation or first generation members have been through or perpetuated on others because of the environment they were raised in or living in. Um, so I wouldn't say that it's uh, per se out of the ordinary. It's not without precedent is what I'm going to say, I guess. Um, presumably, given the amount the, of trauma, yeah. presumably the community ties are strong enough to weather a lot of these storms, external storms. Uh, yes, I, I would say so. I, I'm also wondering about, you know, how the fallout from this particular event, given like the very public and like international global nature of it is uh, going to affect the church. Um, I mean, already you see Sean Moon sort of doing his like little inner church coup thing with a rod of iron ministry slash sanctuary church. Um, and I just don't, I just don't know. I, I can't see it leading to anything good, I guess. Um, but hopefully it leads more people to thinking, you know, I hope it leads more people to sort of dissecting these things and deconstructing what they've been taught and how it actually applies to the world and how it actually relates to things because, you know, yeah, I'm, it's, it's, a you know, did you ever meet, um, this was another question from Elle. Did you ever meet the founder? I can't quite say his middle name, correct? Uh, Sun Young Moon. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So he would uh, often do like tours throughout like, the world he would come to different states in the united states sometimes we would go there and like uh yeah like meet him and then the mem some of the members would get to go in like a private room there and like meet him or whatever and then uh also like a couple times as a kid uh we went to chongkyung which is the town in korea that the church owns and um so there was like some interaction there like not very like one-on-one -on -one or anything you know but like been in the same room with a guy you know so is it like a is the feeling similar to going to a rock concert? It's like, oh my God, there they are on stage. <laughs> or is it a lot more sort of serious? Uh, so I, you know, I guess it probably would depend per member. Uh, there was like definitely this sort of like an excitement uh, that was amongst people when they saw him. Um, but also sort of like this like underlying seriousness of like, we're changing the world. We have to do God's providence. We're here for a reason kind of stuff. So it was like this, uh, like a spiritual joy with like a very stark uh, physical reality seriousness, I guess. I don't, I don't know. Or, or like, yeah. Yeah. Ikoi had previously, <laughs> yeah. Ikoi had previously mentioned on another podcast about the power of immiseration, right? Like the, the, as a sort of route to power, that you you have to keep people down mm -hmm. uh, as a way of ruling, and yeah. I guess maybe that sort of feeds into that idea of it being very serious. You're on a serious mission. 
Yeah. And then, you know, once once Moon would start to talk, uh, a lot of his speech, uh, his speeches were in general, extremely intense. He would like yell and scream at the crowd for hours until he was like crying and his nose was running. And like it was just like this, like constant barrage of the most intense emotions you could possibly imagine about like how. Uh, you know, you're fucking uh, all your all your descendants will go to hell if you don't do this stuff and Mm -hmm. your spirit will die and stuff, you know, and just him yelling this at you like for hours on end. I know at one point he did like a 23 hour lecture like this guy, I don't know how he did it. That might go back cocaine. to the cocaine no. stuff. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. <laughs> One of the things I always talked about was how he needed like three or four hours of sleep a night. And that's always just been like, what? And now I'm like, oh, the cocaine. That's probably it. <laughs> that's probably it. Wow. No, most of the, a lot of the leadership were doing it because they had the, the good stuff straight from some Central and South America. But I wonder why. I wonder why. Right. And, and so, <laughs> so there's a, there's a kind of, um, very set hierarchy to this whole thing uh, is that right there's uh, is there a sort of a way to ascend the hierarchy and and what are the pros and cons of the different places you are on that hierarchy i would say so there's obviously the moon family who is at the top of the rung uh then there would be like uh like old first generation leaders uh then there would be like uh people who had sort of like risen through the ranks throughout the years who were maybe not leaders in the beginning, uh, but had sort of like gained a sort of accepted place in the church community uh, around the world or in the country. Uh, and then there, you know, like several down from there, like, you know, there were national leaders and then there would be state leaders. And then, you know, so, and then there would just be the people who lived under them. <laughs> Right. Um, and you could sort of make your way up through the ranks to a certain degree, but not, you know, all the way to the top, because those are the people who are just kind of there from the beginning at this you have, point. You have, to start your own, at least. you have to start your own cult yeah, I wonder, to the top. Yeah. Is, it as, <laughs> is it as misogynist as, let's say, cults like the religious cults in the U.S., even like the um, the Catholic Church or... Mm-hmm. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, which are it's, incredibly misogynistic. Yeah, it's it's intensely misogynistic. Like one of the basic theolog- theological points is that um, Satan seduced Eve into having sex, and that's the fall. And then she shared that with Adam and poisoned him basically through sex. Uh, so it's basically like the woman did it; she fucked everything up, kind of stuff. Uh, and then you know, in practice, in practice, it's also very, very much. Um, super misogynistic right yeah i Um, was aware of that particularly as the catholic church hierarchy which is cultish and certainly misogynistic invested 3.4 million dollars to promote the anti-abortion rule that was defeated in kansas that's a lot of money i mean it's not the 13 billion or whatever they had to pay in sex abuse payouts but it's still considerable yeah 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 um this this, is a question from claudia uh how does the psychology of folks growing up in that environment differ from those who are drawn to it later in life so a good question yeah um I would say it's just sort of based on having that indoctrination drummed into you from day one and how that's like the norm, uh, like straight out the womb. There are certain like, uh, you know, there's a certain normalization of different things uh, that's just there already. Um, and I mean, I I don't know. I It's easily like comparable to sort of the indoctrination of like growing up in America, uh, mm-hmm. sort of going to school and saying the pledge every day or whatever um it's like you know it's there from day one uh if you're born here and you live here like the society around you is like intensely like pushing that on you um and it's similar in the moonies but like more specific in different ways and like more intense in certain ways too um so like there was i mean like uh gosh yeah like yeah i don't know um it does make sense like that's a perfect analogy of like when you visit another country and you're just kind of floored by either small or massive differences yeah um yeah it's culture shock even like going from outside going from within a mooney community to even like you know just like some people down the street you go to visit their house culture shock you know because that's not what is like right your house 
Right. Yeah, that's not like your house or the people like are the people in the church's house. You know, it's like very different there. Um, and then I guess I would also say that um, uh, I don't know, like a lot of us just have sort of. I mean, we we've had pretty spiritually traumatizing childhoods, if not emotionally and physically or sexually traumatizing childhoods. Uh, and not to say that that's not common on the larger scale either, but you know, when there's like a large religious group sort of like associated with it and then also sort of like repressing anybody who speaks up against it. Yes. Uh, the trauma is obvious in those of us who have grown up in the movement. Um, and it's not to say that those who join it are not traumatized in their own ways from whatever environments they came from, but there's like a very specific type of trauma that I've noticed within those of us who are second generation members or Jacob's children that grew up within it. And um it never really leaves. It's just kind of like learning how to deal with it. Right. So um, this is a question from Kevin, who I think said that he was born into a cult or, or they were, I'm mm -hmm. not sure what the pronoun is. Um, do you feel, uh, no, yeah, do you feel the word cult helps or hinders uh, uh, others' understanding of your upbringing? I would say both. Um I think it's important to like specify more in some ways, like, uh, but you know, like also like other words to be able to use are like you know, Christofascist extremism or uh, like high demand group. Like there are different merits to each sort of like group you can like word language you can use for this. Um, but for most intents and purposes, I find that cult does have sort of like this like powerful impact to it, where it's like people like look something was wrong here, you know. Um, and it makes people want to look. And part of that is just like the fucked up nature of like sociology where people are like, wow, something is gross. I want to look <laughs> at it more. Um, right. It's kind of like that. It's kind of that shock value to a certain degree where it does get like it does get sort of more engagement. People want to hear about it more than if you were just like. I grew up super religious or whatever, you know what I right. mean? Um, right. Uh, but at the end of the day, also like the way that language is used the word cult can also be sort of thrown around to things that are not necessarily a cult and that can cause damage. But for the purposes that I'm using, I, I find it generally, I'm amenable to it. Yeah, I use it a lot. Now also, does a cult have to include shunning? Because I do remember that the Jehovah's Witness clients that I had, if they wanted to leave or were critical, they were shunned, which is their own family members weren't even supposed to uh, talk to them. Whereas in one case, the, the father, who was an elder in the Jehovah's Witness, had sex with everyone in the family, even the family dog. Mm -hmm. And when what? he was exposed, he was not shunned. Yeah. He was he lost his position as an elder, but he was still one of the group. Whereas when she left, she was shunned and not yeah. and no one was to speak to her. Is that an aspect of a cult that if you leave, you are um demonized? That's what they called it in uh, the Jehovah's Witness. She became a demon. Yeah, there is a degree of that for sure. Um, and of course, it varies from person to person, community to, commu to community to community. Um, but there is definitely sort of like a layer of either shunning or uh, like uh, to your face demonization of whoever leaves. Like the word for when you have sex outside of marriage in the Moonies is falling. So uh, there's like a, like sort of an automatic like, you know, this is evil kind of thing. Like you're a fallen angel now or something like that. You fell in from God. Oh, from God's grace. Yeah, right. So there's sort of like sort of like this like satanic luciferian sort of like language about it that they use. Um and then you know like apart from that, yeah, they definitely do like say really awful shit about those of us who have left and how, you know, we're destroying our destiny and our uh, progeny's destiny and stuff and like, you know, all that stuff. Um but you know, some of it is more to your face than others and then some people just kind of won't talk to you. And then other people will just be nice to your face, but like, you know, I don't know. So, but like generally overarching for the church, uh, let's just say I have some friends who write a, a great uh, blog called How Well Do You Know Your Moon? And they at one point got this uh, 
wacky letter from the church about like how they were uh you know destroying their destiny and like all this stuff and or whatever like it was it was pretty intense but it's you know because they were exposing the church and then of course you know the shunning stuff really doesn't apply to leadership at all because like none of that applies to leadership nothing applies to leadership right if you're high right. enough on the wrong nothing applies to you you can do whatever fuck you want <laughs> yeah well the follow-up follow-up question from kevin then what would you do if you saw your old cult leader i imagine punching mine in the throat angel smiley face emoji <laughs> right yeah no same same i would uh probably like yell and scream at him um I would tell everybody that's a fucking pedophile and a cult leader who has like literally led to the death of probably thousands, if not millions of people. Uh, <laughs> so yeah. Right. And, uh, this is another uh, question from Kevin. What would have helped your parents to have not joined the cult? How much blame do they have for your upbringing? Have you had any desire or success in reestablishing trust in authority figures? That's a good question. Um, I think, so I guess in my mom's case, she joined because of spiritual experiences um, that had sort of like led her on a path to, you know, trying to find herself and what she believed. Uh, she's somebody who initially joined another cult uh, at one point and then left that one and then later on joined the Moonies. So she's somebody who's been looking for some, you know, stuff, community, uh, you know, like, belief, like, you know, uh, just a meaning. Um, I think if we had a world in which people weren't so alienated and ostracized from one another, and in which we were able to sort of like fully explore who we are as people in a non-coercive environment, she may not have joined. Um, I think um, if she had not maybe endured the abuse she had in life, she wouldn't have joined. Uh, that left her to feeling like she didn't have meaning or something, you know, um, or a purpose or, you know, an ability to create the environment that she needed without, you know, some sort of like coercive control above her. Um, and then for my dad, I think a lot of it would probably be community for him. I don't know. I mean, I can't like sp say specifically really either way for my parents. I've not like speaking for them, but from what I have like noticed from them, this is my best guess. Um, I, my dad, he, he came to America. Um, he's from Tunisia originally. Uh, so he came to America after living in a couple other countries for a while. And, uh, it was just sort of like going around the country, sort of like, you know, not really knowing, I guess what he was doing didn't have much of a purpose. And I guess he was like, he fell in love with some lady and was like on a bus ride out to Tennessee and then met the church there. So if he had like community and more like human relationship or like you know a, a basis to build his life off of after moving environments completely that might have you know given him an opportunity to not do that uh sorry what were the other parts of that question yeah yeah it's really interesting actually that just the, the whole idea that there's sort of shaky foundations means that you know someone comes along and builds a house on you that's a shit analogy but you know what i mean um right, the, yeah. the, the rest the rest of the question was um how much blame do they have for your upbringing? Have you had any desire or success in reestablishing trust in authority figures? So um, how much blame do they have in my upbringing? I would say that even if they were not necessarily the uh, propelling factors of abuse in all situations, that they were definitely complicit in a lot of it, um, so I would say that there is some blame there and I definitely still have a lot of um, resentment towards them on a lot of levels for how they raised me and, you know, what they kind of subjected me to in my life. Um, but also another part of it is that it's not all their fault because these groups do seek out people who are vulnerable and bring them into that. And my parents are also abused by the group, you know, they're uh, maybe they were like, you know, continuing the cycle of abuse in ways, but they're also abused themselves. Not, not that that absolves them, but it also sort of gives me a little bit of insight. And it makes me understand that they're not completely fully to blame, you know, um, which is freeing in a way, but I also still have a lot of anger. Um, and then when it comes to sort of like resolving my relationship to authority, and my parents in particular, I, I still have a relationship with them. I still talk to them uh we're still 
decently close, you know, um, can't talk about everything or sometimes, you know, we end up arguing a lot, but so, you know, I try to like, I try to set up some pretty intense boundaries there, which has been working out well for me. Um, that's good. Um, but in, in general authority figures, never been a fan, probably never will be a fan. Um, unless somebody absolutely, you know, like knows what they're talking about and is actually in touch with the community around them, who they are speaking for. And it's like, you know, constantly consulting with them to make sure that they are like doing right by the people that they're supposed to be protecting and serving or whatever uh like you know and that's like there's usually very little accountability for any sort of authority figure in society um and generally i'm pretty like mm. pretty you know everybody has a part to play there shouldn't be like huge authority figures if anybody has some sort of figure of authority it shouldn't be like you know outrageous amounts it should just be like who's cooking dinner for tonight or somebody is going to moderate this meeting or something like that, you know, like not, Oh, this person has nuclear codes. Like, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> not that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's ironic what you talk about. Cause on the one hand, capitalist society alienates people from th their labor. They're just working to enrich someone else mm -hmm. alienates people from each other and then encourages these frenetic possessive religious cults, which cement the capitalism that do drove them apart in the first place. A hundred percent. It's a, an interesting thing that to contain people's alienation and misery, they create this alternative. I remember thinking because my son-in-law's parents, um, his father was a Southern Baptist minister and the church really controlled their whole life, that it also, at the same time as they espoused the nuclear family, it replaced it enough so the families could survive. There were the men's groups, there were the children's groups, there were the women's groups, there were the church outings. There was so much support that you didn't have to count on the lousy nuclear family you were from. Mm -hmm. So at the same time as they espoused that, they replaced it in order to survive. And yeah. the same, you know, it, it's interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, going back to what you were saying earlier a moment ago, I think a lot of uh, the resurgence of fundamentalism in different parts of the world sort of has to do with this too, that when people are so alienated, there has to be a way to control them that sort of diverses them from caring about the material reality around them and what is actually going on in the world, in their lives and in the lives of those around them to make it more about like some sort of like future uh, afterlife. And yeah, that sort of like gets like at that point, I think, you know, that creates martyrs too, you know, that creates people who are willing to uh, hurt themselves or others in the physical realm to further uh, a nebulous, like, future life in another plane, you know, that not everybody even agrees on. Right. So it channelizes the rage and alienation that it creates. Yeah. Yeah. It's a yeah, pipeline. I can, I can see why they do that, and I can see why they have particular enmity for socialistic and communal societies because there those needs are met on their own terms. Yeah. Yeah. Elle had asked, how often did you interact with new recruits and did you notice any sort of common patterns or themes in what drew them in? So in my community, the most of the new recruits were adults when I was there. So I didn't interact with them much more than, you know, like a couple words here or there. Um, what I noticed was that they came from a lot of different walks of life, mostly poor people, a lot of immigrants, uh, a lot of very disenfranchised people who dealt with like other mental health or substance abuse problems or maybe had been out of prison. Um, so like, you know, a lot of minority groups, a lot of just uh, oppressed people, you know, um, who were just sort of trying to find a way and find some love and community in their life and that's yeah generally what i saw people that were just trying to reach out for any sort of connection now i was wondering since you were born into um the unification church what prompted you to leave and what was that process like and also like you know what kind of um advice would you offer somebody that is in a similar position that you've so, learned from the process 
Yeah. Um, well, the process started when I was about 14. Um, I took the SATs early and got like an invite to go to this like uh, early college in Virginia. So my family was like, wow, this is a great opportunity. You should do that. So I went there and I, first of all, got like very much needed like physical and emotional distance from the group, which is a huge big thing that's important. Uh, and then like when I was there, I started, you know, meeting new people who I, you know, who were from different walks of life, uh, different backgrounds different experience uh and some of them were you know part of the groups that were sort of the evil other you know like gay people or whatever trans people yeah. uh and here I am gay and trans now so woo <laughs> but uh like it just you know like it led me to being like wow not everybody is as bad or evil as they were made out to be what is this about um so definitely like you know getting to know the people who were demonized that's another big thing uh and then, then at one point I was like wow I wonder people were you know I wonder if people are right if this really is a cult like I've heard a lot of shit about it but like I I don't you know I'm gonna look into it so I started researching I came across my friend's blog how well do you know your moon and I read about something called the tragedy of the six Marys where moon basically uh raped a bunch of married women uh and uh with the uh with the um with the excuse of connecting their lineage to God and I was like Whoa. This doesn't line up with any of the theology and how it's like applied to any of the people in the church. I don't like, how is this real? How is this like, I need to look more into this. So I messaged the blog and was like, I need to talk about this. So we talked about it for a while. Uh, actually ended out of getting up, uh, ended out, uh, ended up getting out of touch for like 10 years recently became really good friends a couple years ago. Um, and so like that learning that, uh, that information that is uh, sort of antithetical to what was taught, what was like how those inconsistencies lined up. And then, you know, how also like, and then realizing, you know, like all the abuse that I saw, especially at the hands of like leadership and stuff and how they were never held to the same standards. Uh, that really made an impact on me. And then when I was 17, I transferred to Indiana University. Uh, I was a horny 17 year old. I was going through the process of trying to get matched. I started when I was like 15, which I still pissed off with my parents for. Cause like, I mean, Hey, right wingers talk about grooming, trying to get your kid married at 15. That's not great. <laughs> like, oh, right. come on. Yeah. Um, like, and I was going along with it cause that's what I thought I wanted. Right. But what I really wanted was to go out and have sex. So I was 17. I was at IU. I was like, I'm going to go and get laid. This is going to happen. So I finally did that. I like finally, you know, like broke off that final piece of like the church that was like, Oh, you're connected to us. No matter what it felt like relieving when i lost my virginity or whatever even though that's a construct uh it, it was like wow i am in control of my own body now and it was like stressful and i didn't know what to do with myself at the time and it was like it, it felt like maybe i was like wow i've like officially cut ties with god now so i guess like I, i'm on my own or whatever um but you know eventually i got more comfortable in myself and who i am as a person um and just sort of like you know doing that that thing that the cult tells you not to do specifically and then being like oh i didn't get smote by god holy shit this is okay i guess um nothing horrible has gone in my life i don't feel ir evil spirits around me or whatever like seems to be okay for all intents and purposes you know uh so yeah um it's empowering, Those would be like what helped, but yeah, it was, it was. Um, and so, yeah, those, those four things for me made the difference. Um, the, the physical and emotional distance and, uh, time and space for reflection, uh, meeting people of the demonized other group, uh, learning inconsistencies with theology and how they are applied and practiced and, uh, between leadership or the membership. Uh, and then also, um, just doing the thing that you're told not to do. Um, <laughs> I like that. That's, really, yeah, that's good <laughs> yeah. advice. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, so like those are those are my those are what I found helpful. Although there are like a lot of different routes to de-radicalization. Um, I think uh, you know, um, trying to think about others could be. I, I have some notes about this somewhere, and I can go more into it at some point. But right now, my brain is kind of blanking. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Kevin has a, <clears throat> a sort of. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I have one more. Go for it. Talking to people who are out or questioning themselves. That's a big thing. Having your own community um, that you're able to actually talk 
face to face with like people who who have been in the same place or are in the same place and have the same or similar experiences to you and being able to express that without fear of judgment. Yeah, that's number five. I actually mm-hmm. think that that probably does answer this question, but I'll just okay. Uh, we'll just record it, and I can always edit it out. But it's kind uh-huh. of a bit long. It's a statement then a question, but I think it's worth reading. Uh, Kevin mm-hmm. says, um, speaking on behalf of my ex cult friends, there seems to be a unique loneliness for us, born and raised, who walk away. The critical thinking necessary to leave a cult is applaudable, but it has select application in the outside world. We try to remove ourselves from cults and cultish thinking as a way to preserve our mental health, but given the cultish nature of our society, especially in regards to capitalism, Americanism and Christianity, removing ourselves means we are necessarily isolated. Even things like Soul Cycle put my brain in alert mode. Furthermore, one of our greatest strengths is breaking or exposing cultish behavior, but this is so rarely useful in our lives because we remove ourselves from those environments. There is a feeling of being trapped and useless. Have you experienced this? And if so, do you have any advice on how to navigate through it? So, yeah, I have absolutely experienced that. Uh, For a long time, I just sort of, I don't know, tried to ignore it or forget about it. Um, and then, you know, I kept being faced with it. It kept coming up on like, you know, a daily basis and either like memories or interactions with my family or those around me, or just like in the world and broad and how that is also like a reiterance of the cult that I was raised in and how that ties in. And it just kept, you know, showing up until it finally, at one point I was like, I, I guess I have to do something about this. Um, but on that, on that page, uh, My community of ex-Moonies is incredibly beautiful and thriving, and I love them all so much. Uh, We have a couple of us right now have um, we're starting this like educational collective slash like uh, de-radicalization group slash like uh, sort of little activist group kind of thing um, where we we like read things about the church and capitalism at large and fascism and imperialism. And uh, we sort of reflect on that. We heal. And then we also are planning at some point. So we're training. We're trying to do like education, uh, get out like, you know, the like sort of do some expose on the group um, as well as uh, hopefully at some point, you know, do more like work with helping to de-radicalize people from that environment specifically. Um, It's it's great. I think, you know, we've all come a long way, especially with gaining this community and being sort of able to like learn from each other and heal together and coordinate our actions a bit so that we're not all doing the same bit of research like 50 different times right or like so that we're not like so that there's like some sort of network of us you know so that uh information passes quickly or that we you know if any of us have a problem we always have somebody to go to um it's very hate to use the word liberating because of the Mooney use of the word, but it is very liberating um, and empowering. And it's just beautiful to see that this is sort of like this Phoenix has risen from the ashes of such a horrific experience for a lot of us and that we're now finding hope and purpose and being able to hopefully, you know, expose and prevent some harm from happening to others. That's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, all you really can do. I was yeah, great. wondering, you know, um, because you mentioned like de-radicalization and there there are, you know, um, various groups to get people out of cults. I don't know if you've had any experience with them, but do you have, if you do, like, can you speak on like the experience and maybe some critiques of the current method? So I don't personally have experience with it, but however, um, my mom, there's, they tried to deprogram my mom at one point and so they had these people kidnap her basically keep her in a basement i guess the guy like offered to have sex with her they were it was like awful and this like really trauma re-traumatizing experience on top of the trauma that was already there from the moonies um oh wow at the end probably re-cemented her belief in the moonies you know uh in ways um because you know she came through that and was still like i'm gonna do this right um Mm -hmm. uh I would say that the whole deprogramming thing is extremely abusive and a cult in and of itself. Um, the, what is it? The cult awareness network is a cult, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, which is, right. you know, really fucked up because language and the way that they present themselves and stuff. Uh, but that is a cult in and of itself. And deprogramming is 
the exact methodology of a cult applied to try to stop a cult, which is just double cult, which is not great. You know, it just it compounds that trauma. Um, right. So it's I kind would of say, the flip side of the coin. Yeah, I would say don't use any abusive tactics that a church uses to try to take somebody out of a cult environment. You don't want to like redo that, right? You don't want to sort of like reinforce that that's okay in any way or like re-traumatize a person because at the end of the day, that's not going to help anybody involved. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I've heard, you know, again, like no, no personal experience, but I've heard you know, people talk about, you know, being in a cult and then having really negative experiences with like the de deprogramming programs that, you yeah. know, they were um, coerced into. And I don't know how problematic it is. I don't know if there are programs that are more sound. Mm -hmm. I don't uh, off the top of my head. That's something I should do a little more research into, honestly. Um, but I guess like, my main point with that is that like deprogramming or de de radicalizing or rather I could say counter radicalizing somebody trying to get them sort of more involved uh, actually into helping their communities, uh, you know, uh, uh, in like sort of a more you know direct way uh, in the opposite direction <laughs> uh, is um, it's a process. It doesn't. It's not fast, and it has to be you know like it takes a lot of time, a lot of reflection, a lot of dialogue. Um, and there can't be like, when you're trying to de-radicalize somebody, you can't come at them from like, initially, like, you know, you really can't be like attacking them about it. You have to meet people where they're at and use their own talking points to sort of be like, hey, so this is my experience with this, or this is what I've heard about this. Uh, what do you think? And sort of like, you know, keep asking them questions. Asking questions is a huge thing, I think. Um, because, you right. know, without that, people wouldn't actually really, like, think on some subjects, per se, because they're not really taught to. Um, and, or, you know, you might be able to make connections otherwise. So it has to really be a dialogue, and there has to be an amount of trust there when you're de-radicalizing somebody. Because it can't just be, you know, somebody you don't know coming in from a group. Because, like, have you ever been to, like, a, a psychi psychologist that you've never met before? That's a weird experience, trying to be like, here's my whole life's trauma. Here's what I think. Uh, let me just, like, talk at you for a while. Um, or whatever. It's kind of similar. It's like um, not the same by any means, but like there has to be a level of trust there in order for people to actually be receptive to any sort of dialogue that would get them thinking. Otherwise, they'll just be defensive or, you know, punch you or whatever. So, right. Well, that was one of the things because I was um, listening to or I was reading uh, this one person's account of their de radicalization uh, program that their family you know, kidnapped them and sent them through. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me a lot of the troubled teen industry. Yeah, yeah. You know, the, there were very, very stark similarities. Um, we interviewed somebody that experienced with that industry. But yeah, I, you could almost kind of interchange the, you know, the process in, yeah. in a very similar way. And that made me realize how much... Yeah, the deprogramming side is just is problematic as well. And that leaves a lot of people without a lot of help or answers. Yeah. I mean, it's you also know, one uh, of those things where like they if they successfully deprogram somebody and through those methods, what support system is there for them afterward? Is there one? No, not usually, not in any way. That's not in any meaningful way. You know, there's not like, you know, you know, continued like talk. There's not like therapy offered there's not like any sort of material support for anybody who's been through a lot of trauma who may not be able to financially support themselves or you know whatever the case may be that's not there so right you're sort of bullied into the cult initially and then you're bullied out of bullied it. out and right and then you're just sort of left without anything wow. is there any 12-step yeah. method of addressing Cult? Well, 12 steps is a cult. <laughs> so, in a sense, <laughs> although it's very voluntary in and out, you don't, there's no punishment for not going to those meetings. Nobody comes after you. Well, this is, That's this well. is, this is one of those things that's really interesting. And I guess, you know, words can always be um, co opted or hijacked. Mm -hmm. But certainly from all the different subjects and people we've spoken to on this podcast, um, the, the sort of overriding theme seems to be. Uh, environments that are sort of based off dominating other people mm -hmm. ultimately screw people up and ones that are about 
cooperation and having yeah. your needs met allow people to uh, blossom and yeah, right. and lead healthier lives. And it seems to me that maybe with 12 steps that I don't know w- w- how the scale tips really because it sounds like there are abuses of power that happen in those situations exactly in the, you know, when people are at their most vulnerable and need help. But there's also loads of stories about that that really turn people's lives around so it's a really tricky yeah. one the 12 steps well i, I mean the church that. can do the the church can do the same thing i think one aspect of evaluating any kind of um environment like what is a positive environment in general right a positive mm-hmm. environment is one that gives you multiple avenues of success yeah. Right. Well, one of the aspects of, you know, whether it's capitalism, whether it's religion, whether it's 12 steps, whether it's a cult um, is, you know, what relationship to power. But definitely they, there is always this sense of there is only one way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. And if you do not follow this one program or like if you can't follow this program, then it's you, your fault for the failures. Right. You brought it upon yourself. Right. And so that's the there are positive things about the 12 steps, right, that, you know, you it is a voluntary organization. You do have the ability to meet, you know, people in similar situations. Um, The negative aspect, again, is that they say that this is the only way and that this works for everybody when it when there is no such thing for anyone. Yeah. Right. Right. One way. That's a really interesting Um, way of framing maybe what's healthy and what's not. Yeah, I think it is. And that there are multiple ways to succeed is very important. Absolutely. I mean, because that's a huge part of, I think, what, you know, Elisa was saying about the community that that you're building. Yeah. Is that you're trying to just get people together and to engage, right? You're you're not trying to steer them into a singular direction. Yeah. You know, but like, hey, like, you know, we have this common experience. Uh, We should, you know, appreciate our diverse experiences um, and just, you know, accept and help each other. Yeah. Yeah. Help each other is really important. And the non judgmental that Elisa mentioned is also a very important dimension. Right. That's. That's the whole part of like more than one path, right? Yeah, because that's the you know that that is kind of what sets the conformity tone. Yeah, of you know a lot of negative power dynamics. Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, in addition to more than one path, the ability to change whatever path you are at at any point in time. Right. The well, I mean, it's flexibility. Yeah, the flexibility flexibility there. Yeah, and understanding the human experience right yeah, you change definitely. over time so yeah. you know you're not required to be like you're, you're not given this you only have one you know cha- one like opportunity to change your mind and that's right. it right. yeah <laughs> yeah you know that that you know you have the the you have the right and the ability and and people giving you like the skill set too yeah right? that's part of like a good community is everyone kind of helping each other you know, build good cooperative skill sets. This, so this this links to uh, Claudia's question. Uh, we'd also be interested in what restorative justice might look like in the context of cults. Is it even possible? It sounds to me like this is... Uh, mm. Obviously, restorative justice is a, a system of criminal justice, so it is very mm-hmm. formal. Um, but this sounds in some ways like a informal rehabilitation, right? Yeah, so we have our informal lanes right now. Although I will, I will say that uh, we are sort of like actively kind of on lookout for any lawyers uh, and like civil rights or human rights or whatever um, who might be able to help us potentially do like a formal lawsuit against the church, like class action wise, on the behalf of um, ex members uh, and maybe even people who are still in it. Who knows? Um, just because I think there is like a certain amount of like uh you know reparations that needs to be paid to us like the amount of money that most people have lost to the church through fundraising teams and uh tithing and ancestor liberation and working for church businesses that don't pay enough etc cetera, etc cetera, uh is astronomical and astronomical. I, 
yeah, astronomical, like billions of dollars. And like, we, there needs to be like, I would love to see some sort of like justice on that part, like to give us back some of that, you know, physical means as long as like, or those monetary means, as long as capitalism is still existing, right? Um, because we have suffered, most members in the church uh, grew up in poverty um, and, you know, our families have suffered for that, you know, uh, we've suffered for that. And I would love to see there sort of be some justice there as well as like, I don't know, some like, I would love to see, I don't know how realistic this is at the end of the day, but I would love to see uh, the government stop using the UC as a tool um, and for that to be exposed as publicly and widely as possible so that people know exactly how that works and what exactly goes on in those circles and how, how that affects people in their lives and um, damages people as well as leads to numerous deaths um, on the global scale. Uh, I would love to see that information get out there even if not maybe in a legal sense, stopping anything, because I don't know how realistic that is working within the legality system of, you know, the fucking capitalist state anyhow. Um, but just to the point where, you know, people know and it's widely known. And if anybody sees something about it, they could potentially, I don't know, you know, just, yeah. I, have I hopes think and it's dreams. important. <laughs> well, I think that's yeah. really important, but I don't see how a capitalist society that depends on yeah. weakening its population through religious cults and religious observations of all I don't kinds. see it like I would see them at most doing a little slap on the wrist kind of thing. But, you know, yeah, yeah in that vein. So I, I'm mostly more concerned right now with sort of the our more informal avenues of justice as well as, you know, um, Empowerment, spreading, really empowerment and uh, education on the subject and uh, sort of ex exposing what has already happened and, you know, how that may continue. That's really important as a, on a social scale, because there's two avenues. One is to talk to other people personally in small groups about what it meant to you. And the other is to try to prevent other people from being captured. Yeah. To have an antidote to the loneliness and desperation that drives people to cults and a political antidote that's not allied with maintaining exploitation, yeah. but liberation. And this conversation continues on our Patreon. So why not join us over at patreon.com forward slash it's not just in your head. Massive thank you as always to our VIP patrons, Alex Placito, Bruce Rogers Vaughan, Jennifer Cox, Justin Harper, Rebecca Johns, Seamus O'Connell, and Sheena Belmas. If you have enjoyed anything you've heard Harriet say in this program, you will definitely enjoy Capitalism Hits Home, which is a solo program that Harriet does through Democracy at Work, which is a worker-owned cooperative that produces other great programs such as Economic Update with Richard Wolff and the Anti-Capitalist Chronicles with David Harvey. I can't recommend enough that everyone also listen to Capitalism Hits Home if you enjoy It's Not Just in Your Head. And you can hear more from Harriet on her radio show called Interpersonal Update. It's on WBAI at 2.30 EST on Wednesday afternoons and in the WBAI archives.